Welcome everyone who's here. I'm Kathy Zeiler. I'm uh, on the faculty at Boston University School of Law. And I'm a board member, a current board member of AMOS, um, which is uh, the organization that is uh, co-sponsoring this webinar with, with um, the Center for Open Science. AMOS stands for Association of Interdisciplinary Meta, Science, Meta Research and Open Science. And I wanted to make a quick plug before Chris gets started um, for the annual conference. This year, it's gonna be held in Brisbane. So if you're looking to have a nice vacation in Australia, uh, it's gonna be on November 21st through 23rd. Um, please see our website for details and the registration should be up soon. Um, I went last year, it was absolutely fabulous. Um, it's two days of uh, really great talks. So, um, but we're gonna attend to the Meta Science Conference now, and I'm uh, very pleased to be moderating this panel, this uh, webinar, as we lead up to the in-person conference in uh, in Washington D.C. next month. And I'm very happy to introduce um, Chris Koch. He is going to talk to us today about a meta study approach to examining the structure of implicit memories. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that Chris can share his and then take it away, Chris. All right. Oh, I should also say, sorry, Chris, uh, before I hand it over, um, for those of you who have questions or you wanna uh, post uh, comments, et cetera, please use the Q&A button, not the chat button, but the Q&A button and um, uh, raise your hand and you can either Speak your question. I can elevate you to speak your question uh, to Chris, or you can type it into the Q and A, and I'll and I can read it to Chris. Whatever you prefer, raise your hand if you want to jump in uh, on the screen. That's fine, and then you can have a dialogue with Chris if that's going to be easier. Um, either way, you can do that throughout. So Chris invites questions and comments as he is speaking. So I'm going to monitor the monitor those and make sure they get get in. Okay, take it away, Chris. All right. Well, um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about some meta science related things that we uh, somewhat uncovered as we're working with a larger uh, task. Uh, looking at implicit association tests. So uh, I just want to do a few things before we really get started. These are uh, some of the students who have been working on different aspects of the overall project and have contributed to uh, today's uh, talk in a variety of ways. Uh, so meta science, I probably don't have to really go over this very much for this particular conference, right? But the goals are really to help um, identify basic elements of scientific inquiry, right? To uh, figure out how um, these elements might interact. We're looking at how we're going to um, determine scientific knowledge, how it's produced. But the last one is really where I bolded a few items because that's what we're gonna probably focus most on today is really improving the quality of the research that's being done and also reducing inefficiencies. And if we look at the, the Venn diagram over here, we're really looking at mostly a data reuse and maybe a little bit on a statistical uh, critique. Uh, but those, those are probably the areas that will, will hit most um, throughout this. Uh, so just a little bit of background. Um, this is going uh, maybe a little bit more than um, what we need for meta science, but it gives you a, a reason of why we're actually looking at any of this to begin with. Um, when you look at memory, memory is generally broken up into explicit memory, things that we're consciously aware of, and then implicit memory or the things that we are not consciously aware of. Semantic and episodic memory, so memory for facts and, event, and events are typically semantic and episodic. And then you have a variety of different types of implicit memory. And the one that probably is most tied to the implicit association test is that of, of priming. And you can see priming it, we have changes in perception and belief caused by previous experience. And, and so that's, that's what um, we'll probably focusing most on just within the implicit memory. Okay. But there's also how-to knowledge and perceptual learning and, 
and other types of uh, associative learning. Now, the implicit association test has five blocks of trials, and they're all structured basically the, the same way. You start off with some concept words. So that's in the first block, and, and you have keys usually on two different sides of the keyboard. So I'll just for to demonstrate for the talk today, I'll, I'll just mention A and L. And so uh, you may have a concept word related to um, uh, individual's weight, right? So you may have um, you may have like muscular or you may have heavy or something like that, right? So these are concept words around weight. And then if it's a, if it's a positive trait, let's say we'll press A. If it's a negative trait, we'll press L. Okay, so that's your concept, those concept words. And then you have evaluative words. And evaluative words may be like, um, you know, just, well, basically just like good, bad, right? Lazy, right? Or whatever, whatever words um, fit with a particular I, uh, concept you're looking at, right? So we may have words that are related to positive aspects of individuals and then also maybe some negative things. And negative things probably might be related to the stereotype that, that is potentially out there. Uh, so they're going to press A and L for those words as well. And then they have a third block in which they get both. So now you press A if it's uh, normal weight and good. You press L if it's heavy or bad. Okay. And so you have the combination. Now those, uh, I underlined, it con underlined congruent here because those are kind of congruent with the stereotype that we might have, like a person who's very heavy might be lazy. Right. So those two things will go together. And then, and then what happens is you switch the words. So you switch the keys that they press. So now when it's instead of lazy and they're hitting L, they press the A key. So you switch the coding of the concept words, and then you have them do it again. So now the concept word for lazy is with someone who's a normal weight instead of someone who's overweight, which is more stereotypical. And so those then would be the incongruent pairs that you would have. And you're really interested in the difference between these two conditions, between the congruent condition and the incongruent condition. If something matches our belief, our implicit belief system or bias, we're going to respond faster than if it doesn't. So that's that's really what you're looking at with this IT. And IT has been around for uh, quite a while, which is part of the reason why we looked at it. It's, been researched fairly well for about 25 years. Now, here are some typical words in an IAT, just to give you an idea what the evaluative words might be like. So you have words like happy, peace, joy, right on the good side, and, and terrible, war, agony could be on the bad side. Um, I bolded war just because um, the analysis I'm going to show you in a moment has to do with word count. And this is just matching word, war or just matching the word, in this case, war. Uh, so it doesn't look at variant. So it doesn't include like warship, warplane, warlord, um, war-torn, pre-war, post-war, right? All those are in a in a corpus, but they're not the words that were, that were matched. So here's, here's what you find um, with this. And this is, I took the labels off because it was a little bit harder to read, but you're looking at frequency on the Y and response time on the X. And so what happens as your frequency goes up, your, your response time is slower responding to the words. As the a, as a frequency goes down, it takes you longer to respond. And this is kind of typical of a, of a frequency effect that we find with explicit memory. The other thing is this is borrowing response times from another study. So the, the one nice thing in terms of like the, this conference is that there are some larger data sets that are out there that allow you to get some of this information without doing the study yourself in, in a sense. So you can really get a good idea of, of what's going on with, in this case, the words that are being used. And the good words are responded to actually faster than the bad words just by responding to the words. So this is not including them in the IAT yet. This is just, if the words are on their own, you respond faster to the good words than the bad words, right? And you respond faster to the words that are more frequent than less frequent. This is looking at the good versus bad words that are used actually in the race IA team to see a similar pattern. Right? So the good words are responded to faster than bad, and you have a frequency effect here as well, where the more frequent the word, the less the slower the response, I mean the faster the response time. 
Right? So when I just kind of like take those kind of, I try to account for those word frequencies from existing information, uh, you can you actually see a decrease in the T value that you get for the study for the comparing the congruent incongruent condition, and the, there's a decrease in effect size, and and that's probably not too much a too a trivial a thing because one of the criticisms of the IAT is that the effect sizes are not always very large to start with, and so when you account for the word frequency, it seems to even decrease some more. So. Um, so if you do this overall correction, there is some indication that you really are getting um, some frequency impact on the IAT itself. Okay. So that's an important one important reason for looking at the frequency and the IAT. Um, the other thing is this, and this is part of the reason why we started looking at this. And we don't have to worry too much about the rest of this diagram. It's this part right here, the semantic system. So when, when we talk about frequency effect, I mentioned that it's usually associated with explicit memory. So if we go back to that slide, right, explicit memory, we're dealing with semantic memory and episodic memory. And we're oftentimes probably even more focusing on semantic memory, which is general knowledge, right? So what's different here though, is we're using an implicit task. And those implicit memory tasks are, um, as kind of suggested right here, right? These are indirect measures of something, which is why the IIT is actually a really good task because you can't, if we're just looking at a race IIT, you say, you know, you can ask somebody, are you racist? And they're probably not going to say, well, yeah, I am. Thank you for asking. I mean, they're, they're going to cover that up, right? So we have self-presentation skills that we engage in when we know that someone's asking us a question that it would be inappropriate for us to respond in a particular way. And we want to present ourselves in a more positive light than maybe we actually think. Right? The implicit association test, it doesn't allow you to do that because these are immediate responses that you have. They're, at, they're, they're operating below your level of awareness, right? below consciousness. And so you don't have the ability to control in the same way as you would if you're filling out a questionnaire. Right? So, the, the thing that would be interesting and part of the reason why we started taking this on is that if there's a frequency effect with these implicit tasks, it could very well mean that we're ask, we're, we're, we're taking memory right, and we're, we're accessing memory the same with the same type of mechanism. It's just a level of awareness in the process that changes between explicit and implicit. And, and a reason, here's some different ways you can, you can kind of conceptualize that, right? So explicit memory is going to be more up here, a conscious mind, you know, interfacing here with thoughts and feelings. And then you have insights, intuitions, things like that. These are kind of more pre-conscious. If you look at it this way, um, I was kind of hesitant to show this because this is usually attributed to like trying to describe um, Freud's theory, but, but uh, you know, if you look at an iceberg above the water, this is, uh, this is all conscious mind. Right below is, is pre-conscious, but then you have this big part of the iceberg that's really uh, much lower, and that's that's the unconscious mind. Uh, so what we're really talking about is, is that um, if we kind of think of this as memory, you know, we're accessing memory, but some of some of the time we're aware of it, and some of the times we're not. Right? And if, it's, if we're aware of it, it's explicit or not. It's implicit, but we're getting the information the same way if we show these similar effects across implicit and explicit types of memory tasks. This is another way to kind of look at why this might be an important thing to examine because this has those different types of memory that I've been talking about, but also associated with the different parts of the brain. And so usually when we're talking about things and we think, well, um, semantic memory is really more the medial temporal lobe, whereas priming is gonna be more like neocortex, and we're thinking that, okay, since they're operating in different parts of the brain, they're actually different things, right? And so what I'm kind of suggesting with this frequency effect uh, within, an, within an implicit memory task is that suggesting that we're actually have a memory store that we're possibly accessing either consciously or non-consciously. Okay. So 
that's that's a big reason for the motive behind the study itself. Now, if we this is relatively easy to do to look at the uh, frequency effect, in that all we all we have to do is kind of recode the data, so that you know when we know what word is presented or what image is presented, we can see if it's a high or low frequency. We can actually put in the frequencies from like a corpus or something like that and co-vary them, or we could categorize them as high, low, um, medium frequencies, and then we can analyze to see if there's a difference between those. In order to do that, we actually have to have trial by trial data. And so that's one of the things we'll get to. But um, there are some other reasons for picking the IIT for this. And that is, like I said, it's been around for a while. And there's also the Project Implicit website through Harvard, and they have a lot of people going there and doing these tasks. And so they, they literally have millions of people that have done various types of IAT tasks. And that data is largely available. And you can look at things over time. So I'm gonna give you a, an example of looking at something over time. And one of the, one of the things that, that you know, we've kind of started exploring uh, just by looking at these differences over time. Um, now, what they have found, Charles Worth and Banaji have found, is that uh, there are certain biases that seem to have decreased over time, and there's certain biases that seem to have increased. So the one example that we've had on the slides is the race IIT. That seems to be decreasing. Uh, the other one I mentioned, the body weight, that one seems to be increasing along with age and disability. So there are changes that can happen with the implicit associations that we think uh, people are making. And this is an example of one of those things when trying to figure out why. Okay, so we can look at these over time. And again, so this is kind of, you can see visually what these tasks are like. So here's your concept. And it's not a word in this case, it's an image. So you have to say whether this, this individual is a European American or African American. Then you have your evaluative words. You have to say whether this word is good or bad. And then you have both together, right? And so that's your combination. Okay. This is from a different site. I mentioned the implicit uh, project implicit site. This is the uh, OPL stands for Online Psychology Lab. And this is done through APA or the American Psychological Association. And this is looking at data, actual um, response time data from individuals from 2006 on. And you can see that the incongruent times are slower than the congruent times pretty much across all that time, right? And that's what you would expect based on what, we've, what I've been saying about those uh, associations we're making. This though is interesting, right? Because you have this big bump in the uh, response times, right? And, and the difference between the congruent and incongruent trials. And not only is it a big bump where the times are much slower and the difference is increased, but it's also opposite of all the other times. Right? So uh, this seemed to warrant some further investigation, right? And, um, and just to point out, right? So this is primarily when you're looking at OPL, uh, site, you're looking primarily at college students, some community college students, and sometimes there are some high school students, but there'll probably be um, junior or senior. So that's kind of the age range you're looking at, maybe um, 16 to 22, something like that. And, and we took samples, we, we looked at samples from um, primarily introductory courses and from various regions around the country. So we broke the country up and took different samples from different regions. And we use both public and private institutions. And when you do that, you see something like this. Uh, here are the times, um, or here, here are the differences that they have. And you see, this is actually starting in 2010. So in 2010, 11, and 12, they're up higher like they were before. And then you can see that they drop. Okay. This is actually looking at each individual school as a sample. And you can see the difference across um, the different uh, different samples or classes across time. And it really is those 10, 11, 12 times that are giving you a slightly different level of IAT than more recent times. Okay. 
All right, so the question then is, if this really is something that's out there, why? And so we start looking at a few different things. And this is a great way to look at some other tools that are available that look at large amounts of data to try to help us figure out what's going on in our in our studies. This this uh, top graph is really just from uh, it's from PsychInfo actually, and so I looked at the number of publications uh, regarding the IIT per year, and you can see that there was a steady increase. I said it's a 25 years. So the, the original article is 1998, um, looking at the IIT, and you can see that steadily increased to about 2013, where peak has kind of dropped off. Uh, this is Google searches. Right? So using Google Trends, looking at Google searches for both either um, IAT or implicit association tests. And they, they, they're they right on top of each other. So they're, they're pretty similar. Um, this peaks, the, the timelines don't match up the same. This peaks in 2008. So it seems like there, the public interest in IAT kind of peaked about five years before it did for researchers. Um, so that's in a sense interesting, but part of the reason we looked at this was, well, was there an increase in interest in the IAT around 10, 11, 12? And did that promote some type of uh, difference in how people responded? And the answer to that is probably not because the peak increase is much is earlier than the change we saw in that data. Uh, this is looking at just people just looking at um, race. And you can see this is 2010 starting here. And this, there's no difference in people how people search for race before or after that time period where there's that change. Um, if this bottom line is, uh, you know, maybe they're looking at other things right? besides just race. This is uh, critical race theory. And um, and it's, it's where you see it's just flat. There's no differences there. Um, is it due to some high profile uh, event that happened that had a lot of media coverage? When we started looking at some of the earliest, you know, really big uh, media events around um, incidents of, of uh, in this case, violence, um, and those all occurred after, right? So those didn't seem to be good. Um, hate crimes actually seem to decrease during the time period where this increase in the IAT happens. So that doesn't seem to be a great explanation. We looked through databases that had the top news stories uh, for every year. Nothing in particular really stood out. Um, looked at economic factors in 2009. The wealth gap had increased to its largest amount at that time. That directly preceded when there was this bump. So is, is that possibility uh, for why we saw that bump and possibly, but um, and when you look at additional data, right, there was also an increase around 2021 and there wasn't an additional bump in that IAT curve we saw. Uh, so that doesn't seem like a great explanation. So let me start looking at other things, right? Could it be a could it be a political figure, right? Someone who's popular. In this case, um, uh, President Obama was elected in um, he was elected in two thousand eight, inaugurated in two thousand nine. The change came in ten, eleven, and twelve. So these are shortly after he assumed his presidency. Now the interesting thing in terms of this being an explanation is that we didn't see the bump start during the campaign. And we didn't see it continue throughout his presidency. And so if this is a possibility, it only lasted for a relatively short amount of time. Right. So what's that cause for that spike in implicit bias? It, that's an interesting question. It doesn't seem to be a fluke in the data because it's the same task. Um, and, the, and we had a consistent response from students from around the country. Um, over a period of time, uh, the various reasons that I just talked about, they all are possibilities, but they don't seem particularly satisfying. And it may be that we're not looking for a, a factor, but it's, and it makes sense if it was a combination of factors, actually, that all kind of came together at a particular time that changed the associations that people were making. But if that's the case, it, though, it does suggest that there are some economic, political, uh, 
sociocultural factors that can have some type of temporary effect, at least on the associations with implicit bias that people have. Now that, if you can figure out exactly what that is, well, now you have some ability to possibly influence um, negative biases that people may have. Now that may have some additional ethical concerns associated with that, but that's those are those are some possible implications. Right? So the IIT again is great because there's it's been around for a while. You have a site that collects a large amount of data, and then um, you know we can see there's actually multiple sites that have a large amount of data on it, and we can look at trends and we can you know download the data and we can examine it. That part is all great. But what we needed to do for ours was not just look at the data that they had, but we needed to look at the um, the trial by trial data. And I mentioned that before. The trial by trial data tells us how they respond to the positive word or the negative word, or the the word that um, you know, like if you if you're looking at depression, for instance, which is a, an IAT, and if if you say sad is is used much more frequently than something like melancholy, right? And so if you're if you're looking at those, we need to know how do they respond to each word every time those words are presented. And that's what you don't get when you go to these data sites, uh, because they have the basically the clean data, right? The data that is in that final analysis. And so you have the summaries for each person but you don't have their individual responses across all their trials. And for an IAT, that can be, you know, we're just to give you an idea what we're talking about, and actually I'm kind of jumping ahead of slide, but um, this part I just want to say, you know, there's, there's different things that we decide about data. One is like, what data do we include, right? So here's your data selection. This is just from a study looking at um, uh, inequalities in education. And you can see they're starting off with, you know, just over 485,000 people that seem to fit the, re the general requirements. But as they start looking at more and more of the requirements related to the study, they end up with just over 24,000 people that, that they can look at, right? So, and then depend if you're doing other research, you may say, okay, I'm only going to include people that respond at least 75% correct, right? If they're, if they're making more errors than that, they're not going to be included in the data analysis. Um, we can look at people that have inordinately long response times and say, okay, anybody who's responding more longer than this, which is really beyond the what's typical, then we're, they're not going to select them. There might be um, people who, you know, they might skip a question or two, and there are techniques to fill in missing data, but at some point there's too much data to fill in, right? So we have to say if they if they don't complete a certain amount, then we're not going to include them. Right. So there are ways that we have, there are criteria that we set as cutoff values to say, this is data we're going to keep, this is data we're not going to keep. And then we do that analysis, we come up with a data file, and that data file that we do the analysis on is the one that we usually post in these data repositories. And that's the kind of data that was available for the IAT. There's the other thing about, related to this, right, is the data maintenance part, which is, it's not just the data that we collect, right? It's also the data that we make available and the data that we keep. So for instance, I can tell you that the OPL site, when they did the IAT, they, they automatically calculated the congruent and incongruent times, and that's the only thing they saved. So you can't go back and get the trial by trial data for that site because they made a choice in the beginning what would be saved and what would not. With a project implicit site, we can actually go back and get original data, but you're looking at a huge amount of data. So um, I was looking at the race IAT, just for 2022, there are over 750,000 people who've taken that. That's a lot of participants. And then when you look at their individual files, their individual files are probably going to be about 120 uh, trials, and then for each trial, you're going to record, um, you can you can vary how much you record, but you're at least going to need like what condition are they in? Uh, what was what was presented? What word or what picture was presented? How long it took them to respond? What response they made? And whether or not the response was correct. So you're looking at probably at least five pieces of information for each trial for every participant. 
And so when you start adding it up, that's a lot of data, right? And um, try going through individual files for like 750,000 people. I mean, that, that's that's just a lot. So this is um, actually from a, a um, an article he was talking about uh, data storage and not research itself. But is I I copied it because it was it was, seemed relevant here. There are some things that we do. We 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 want to have it be cost efficient. That's one very practical thing. But then, um, how well can we access the information, right? And when you start having so much data, it it's almost becomes overwhelming as to what to do. And so that's an issue. And then also, how much space do you need? What's what's the storage requirements? And how easy is it for you to distribute these? Um, the, these data files. Uh, so these are all um, all important considerations. And you notice what, as he was talking about uh, data storage, his algorithm is basically you pick two, right? So we may get something that's really cost efficient and is really flexible and is easy for people to get access information, but it means that it might not it, it might be reduced information, right? And so we, we're making if we pick two. The other one might be compromised, and and so we I think we kind of see that a little bit here. But also it also makes sense, right? These are just practical issues we have to deal with when we're dealing with especially large amounts of data. Okay, so here's here's I'm gonna, before I go to the next slide. So what I've really focused on mostly here is is the words. Okay. So the the words we can look at we can get a corpus uh, we can look at a we can actually even go to Google we have an engram viewer we can get word frequencies that are pretty easy to get and we can control for frequency right but there's another aspect to some of the IATs and that is it's not just a word that's presented it's also a picture that's presented okay? and so that's what we can we're looking at here now this is great again because Project Implicit, they also have an associated OSF site. And on that site, you can download the data from um, 2000, I think it's 2000, it might be earlier than 2010, but you can get data for every year. Um, and you can also get these. These are their picture files that they showed. Okay. Now, one of the things that is important when you're looking at, at uh, Faces in particular, right? There are certain dimensions that are that help us recognize uh, who people are, um, and there's certain features that are kind of less important. Um, what I did is I, I took we took these um, these pictures, right? These twelve pictures, and and borrowed some questions that was used in another study, and so we took these pictures individually put them up on the screen, followed the, the design of another study where they showed a picture, the picture went away, and then they asked a couple, they asked a series of questions. So here are the questions, right? How blank was the previous face? And so on a scale of one to seven, you're gonna have dominant, threatening, right? Trustworthy, all those things. What we're really interested in this particular case are these two things that they included. How stereotypically black is the face? How stereotypically white is the face? because how that face matches up with a stereotype can influence how people respond. So that was one set of questions. Here's the other set of questions. Um, you know, how likely are you to sit next to the person on the bus or share an Uber or things like that. So these are kind of more face, uh, more behaviors related to the individual, but this is, this is kind of what their initial perceptions are about that particular face. Okay. Now there are other things that we could ask. Uh, related to face and some are kind of more, you know, maybe kind of more biometric measures like uh, what's the shape of the eye? Uh, how big are the eyes? How far apart are the eyes? How wide is the nose? How long is the nose? You know, we, we can ask questions like that. Those are all important for face perception as well. Symmetry is important and that seems to be tied to attractiveness and attractiveness can influence uh, responses depending upon what we're asking. Right. So there are a lot of things that we can ask about a face to see how good a face is to use in a particular study. And I'm bringing it up because we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But in this case, I looked at these all these faces based on those questions. And this is looking at them specifically for how stereotypically white or black that people perceive them. 
And this was done using um, put the face put the cert, the uh, questionnaire into uh, we posted it through MTurk and uh, had a couple hundred responses. And so all these women are rated as more stereotypically white than black. All of these women are rated as more stereotypically black than white. And all of these men are rated as more stereotypically white than black. I move these to the side because these faces were not rated that way. Right? So there is no difference between how stereotypically black or white they saw these faces. And what's significant, potentially significant about this is that they're all the male faces, all the black male faces. Right? So this is not something that's kind of spread out across all the conditions of the face. This is one, can, one set of faces that seems to be responded to differently than the other three sets of faces, which may introduce some systematic bias into the responses. Right. So it's important when we're using different, um, different types of stimuli that we understand exactly what we're showing and what we're asking people to respond to. Okay. Now, in order to, to do that, we kind of need like a, a stimulus repository, right? We've gotten much better at the data repositories, but what about repositories for the stimuli themselves? The, we do have some good uh, places to go to, but they're not really stimulus related, right? So there's, there's uh, this one, there's psych test. So if you want to find a test, and that, I didn't add this bold, it was right there, right? Instantly find and download instruments for research and or teaching, right? So you can go here and you can get a test. And if you're interested in some type of uh, personality dimension, um, or, you know, other some other type of individual difference that you can look at, maybe a particular condition, uh, there are a variety of things that you can get a, a measure for and evaluate where does each individual that I have in my sample fall. There are other sites like this. Uh, you have like the um, positive psychology site at the University of Pennsylvania. They have a variety of measures that are used for um, like authentic happiness and mindfulness and things like that. And not only do you have the names of these, but you have uh, the description of them. You have links to them if they're available. You have the original sources that um, for the references and all the psychometric information. So they're great places to go to, to get a lot of information about instruments that you can use. Um, there's an IPIP site, the International Personality Item Pool. You can go there and there's a lot of information about different sets of questions that you can use for different types of things that you wanna look at related to personality. And it has, again, all the reliability information, it has links to original articles. Again, another good place to go to, but they're not, like faces or voice files or object files or things like that that we might use in other types of research. And so that kind of gets us to this idea of, well, do we need to start developing stimulus repositories um, in a more strategic way? And so here are some of the desirable characteristics of data repositories. This is from NIH. And so you can see a variety of those. And most of these are really applicable to a stimulus repository as well. Uh, so I won't I won't go through all of them, right? But um, you know, uh, persistent identifiers. So being able to create a, DO, a DOI for these, um, having them being available for a period of time. But then also this metadata, right? So not just if we go back to the face example, not just the face. So here's a set of faces that I used in the study but all the information that goes along with that face. So, you know, before we did it, we tested it. And here are all those, like those biometrical measures that I said. Here are some ratings that people had about how attractive they thought the person was or how, you know, stereotypically whatever they thought the person was, right? So you can have all that information about every face that's included in this, in this uh, stimulus set. And then as a researcher, I can go there and say, I, when I wanna do a face perception study, Someone has basically done all the background work on those faces for me. And it's in a way that it's, I can reference it, right? So the people contributing to it have that reference and the people that are using it have the reference as well. But that metadata is going to be really important to know how well, um, to know what, what's appropriate uh, use for those. 
And then also like the curation and quality assurances associated with those stimuli. So those are going to be some of the big ones. Obviously, some, some of these others are going to be important as well. But this is these are some uh, practical things to take into account when we're looking at maybe creating a stimulus set. Now, um, these sets can go here. Um, I mentioned in a more systematic way. And so what might be great to do is to actually have um, specialists in these areas. So you may have specialists associated with face perception, stick with that one. And they can get together and say, look, these are all the important dimensions that we need to evaluate for a face to know if it's good to use in a study, right? And then those become the, the, the dimensions that you collect data on. Those become the things that you fill in for your metadata associated with each picture, right? And so now you have a set of experts who are saying, this is what needs to be done to have a really good quality stimulus. And then and all that information is available for all the pictures. And it could be faces. I mentioned voice files. Uh, if you're doing like, um, oh, you can do like emotional processing of, of voices or something like that. Well, what makes a good voice for a particular emotion? So those are kinds of things you can use. If you're doing uh, object perception research, when you're looking at objects and you're seeing what people what people can, um, how they identify them, right? So you know, like just you could look at a number of different areas of psychology, um, which was where I'm focusing. And then, and then build out these data set or stimulus sets based on the recommendations of experts in the area. So you basically have like recreating a, like a set based on best practices of this is what needs to be included or considered when you're using whatever type of stimulus. And I, I think um, this is kind of, I've heard this, I, I've heard this, people say this, and it's kind of interesting to talk about like at, in, about this at a conference, right? But this is, you're dealing with a bunch of people from a bunch of different areas, right? So a lot of you are not going to be psychologists like I am, right? But um, we're all together, right? Dealing with meta science, okay? Now, so what happens like in LU psychology, what's happened in psychology is that these, some of these large conferences that used to, everyone would get together, um, they've, they've even become specialized. And so what will happen is, you know, like I'll go to a, a conference and it's going to be mostly like perception people, right? And the social psychologists who might be interested in uh, prejudice, prejudicial and stereotypical uh, behavior, they're not going to be at that conference anymore, right? So we're missing the interaction between different disciplines that might have been, or different subgroups within a discipline that might have been helpful in, in developing uh, you know, really well and you know, tightly done experiments because we, we don't interact with each other anymore. And this kind of tears that down because it provides a, a space where all that can take place and we can benefit from the expertise of people in other areas as it pertains to the studies that we want to do. Uh, so that's kind of what we're thinking as we're talking about um, not data repositories, but stimulus repositories to try to help improve research. And so here, here are some of the things, just kind of um, getting down to a summary here, is that um, the, the IAT is great in that there are some things that it does really well. Um, you can, I didn't mention this earlier, but you can go on to GitHub, you can download um, an, an, an IAT example, where in theory, all you have to do is change your stimulus files and then everyone can be running the exact same study, right? So if we can, we can all agree on this is the best methodology, you can download something, you can download something like that, and we're all doing the same thing, which is obviously going to help generalize ability as we include all these different samples that we're working with. The data and the stimuli are all available on OSF, right? So that's great. So we can go there, we can get all that information. So there's some things that are really good about the IAT. But when we start looking at specific things, like does frequency of the, of the different stimuli matter or does how stereotypical a face used or an image used in one of the other IITs, does that matter? We can't get that information because that information is not saved. So we may have to look at something like, do we need to include trial by trial? And the one that I, the one that I mentioned 
with over 750,000, what we may need to do in, in that case is say, look, you just have too many. Um, that's too much data. So if you have a situation like that, maybe take a random, a stratified random sample of all your participants and you, and we make these um, repositories, you know, this type of data available on the repositories, like up to this many participants, right? So if you're dealing with maybe 300, 300 is a lot less than 750,000, but it's a lot easier to deal with something 300 or less than something that large uh, with, with the IIT. So, so there is some need for additional information that is collected that we don't all get. And, and so sometimes these things sort of make uh, doing other follow-up research a lot easier. And, you know, kind of think about it, if, if we're able to show um, a frequency effect with someone else's data who, who didn't design the study to look at that, right, then neither of us are potentially biasing our study at all, right? Because they're, they originally didn't collect the data to look at it and we didn't collect the original data, right? So um, the, some of that experimental bias uh, is gonna be eliminated. And then the possibility of, of developing standardized stimulus sets that are a variety of sets that are available for researchers to use to really make sure that they, they don't have any potential confounds in their study and that they, they can be assured that they're using the, the best possible stimuli uh, for the studies themselves. Um, so those are kind of the recommendations we had going through this process. Um, I mentioned some of these already um, in terms of what a stimulus data set should include and, um, and what data, data repositories uh, could potentially include as well. So I believe, yes, it is. That got me, that's, that, that is uh, everything I wanted to say about this based on the project we were engaged in. And uh, it does leave us some time. So if you do have questions, I'd be certainly happy to try to answer those as best I can. Great. So, so yeah, if you have a question, if you want to jump into the queue, please um, raise your hand and I'll see it pop up. I can, um, click on a button that will allow you to speak your question, um, or you can just write it into the, um, the Q&A. Um, so we do have one question in the Q&A from uh, Judu Ivarasu. Um, and mm -hmm. Judu says, does it, does it mean that associations and implicit memory can change due to extrinsic factors, social events, political events, et cetera, apart from inherent individual differences? I, I think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I think it's possible, especially like if you go, if you think back to the one slide I had with priming and it had based on experience, all of those social things that are happening are actually part of your experience as well. So it is, it's very possible that it can. Now, to the extent that it changes it over a period of time, I'm not, I, you can't tell from the data that I showed you how long the impact is going to be. It looks like it might be temporary, but um, I would I suspect depending upon the type of experience, it will be longer lasting. Great. Um, I have a I have a question. Um, so uh, I I completely agree with your recommendations. I think they're it sounds like they're good, they're really valuable. Um, you know, the more data we have. For example, the better we can we can um, try attempt to replicate work um, and minimize differences between the original study and the replication attempt, um, and and the other uh, positive benefits that you suggested are great. One question that I've been thinking a lot about is kind of institutionally: how do we uh, create incentives for people to post these sorts of th that information on? you know, OSF or their data repository to think about those pieces as data, kind of how do we, how do we get this going other than coming to conferences and presenting the ideas and hoping that they'll, the people listening will catch on and, and actually do it. Uh, that's a good, it's a good uh, question. And part of it um, may be, I mean, the journals are probably going to, they can play a part, right? Uh, so some journals now won't 
even review unless you have posted your data somewhere, right? So that that's a possibility. The other thing is, you know, like if you spend some of these things, creating a stimulus set that's really good can actually be quite time consuming, but it hasn't really been considered scholarship. Um, it's It gets you to the ability to perform the scholarship that you want to engage in. And so um, maybe reevaluating or, you know, um, somehow giving different uh, different level of credit to uh, developing high quality uh, data uh, stimulus sets would be a way to encourage it as well. So if, if you can actually create something, post it, and, and that becomes a valuable reference for you, for your research, other people's research, um, you know, because these, these um, I don't think I mentioned it specifically, but you know, I, I mentioned about using experts as a way to evaluate like what things should be included, but you can have experts evaluate what's in, what's actually uploaded. And so if you include like a peer review process to that, then it becomes something that might be deemed much more uh, a you know, source of scholarship and would encourage people to do it as well. So I think those probably those two things um, would have the would kickstart it the most. Yeah, that's great. The the Open Science Foundation actually had in their guidelines has uh, you know w- one recommendation is to uh, formalize citation practices around data sets so that people actually have an incentive to create data sets that other people are using and they get cited for them, which you know is is our kind of currency of um, of credit. Uh, Judu has a follow up question. How do we select concept words for studying personality concepts when there are extrinsic influencers as well? How do we partition between inherent influencers and influence due to extrinsic factors? Hmm. So, so the concept words, yeah. Um, I think I had a I had a part of uh, that one slide that said it's I think the, these uh, these words are really tied to stereotypes, um, and so if you're looking at, I mean the concept words right for sure um, are really if you're looking at weight you're going to look at um, normal weight and overweight uh, because that's 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 where the bias normally is uh, with people that are are heavier, and then. Um, what are the things that people think about naturally when they think about people that are overweight? Now, I don't know if that's a great, this is almost like a circular definition in a, in a sense is, you know, I, what what do people normally associate with heavy people? And then, then we put it in an implicit memory task and, and then we, and then we get it, we get it a different way. Right. Um, but you're looking at, at things that are tied to like, um, really more of a stereotype of, of what they think. Now, it, it, it doesn't always have to be about a stereotype as well. Sometimes the stereotypes are not as clear. There are certain things that people just like more than other things. So there's one of the first IETs was with flowers and insects. And so you had a different set, you had a set of, of flowers, and then you said, okay, this is a flower, this is not, right? And this is an insect, and you just, you just categorize that way. And then you had your evaluative words, and people will rate the flowers as being not, you know, better than the, the insects. They, people generally don't like insects. The bad words get associated with the insects. Good words get associated with the flowers. And so in that case, you have like here, what are the typical flowers that people usually ha- you know, are aware of, right? And so you want to include those. If you start using names for flowers and no one knows what they are, then they may not even know it's a flower. And then for insects. So it kind of depends on the concept. Some of these are like I said, are kind of stereotypical types of words um, or words associated with a stereotype. And then others are kind of like, I'm looking at flowers, I'm looking at insects. I'm going to pick common flowers and common insects. Uh, so it, it kind of depends on the concept. I hope that that answers that. Great. We've got another question mm-hmm. from Emma Mills. She says, did do you say at the beginning that you may touch on statistical analysis critique? If so, could you talk a little yeah. bit more about that? Were you referring to researcher degrees of freedom and analysis choices here? Yeah, you know, um, I was I was thinking if you, if you go specifically for like the, the example that I use about 
word frequency. Um, that is something we can statistically control for that was not done in the original. Uh, so we can either go in and say, oh, they use this word, here's the corpus I'm using, here's the word frequency, and then we can covary it, or we can categorize things by like low, high, medium frequency words and look at it that way. Um, but that was really kind of going back and saying, okay, if, if we if we want to take a, a task like the IIT and look at a different variable that they didn't include, but we can we can reasonably include based on the data, based on what should be in the data files, then we can add that variable in, uh, or we can recode something, and then we can redo the analysis accounting for that other factor that we think might be important. Um, so that that's really what I was I was thinking about in terms of, you know, if something was missing. Um, and the data sets allow us to go back and add that in after the fact, then we can actually make the make, we can make the correction off the original data instead of having to do the whole thing over again. Yeah. Another but, question in terms from of degrees of freedom. Yeah, there's a lot of choices the researchers get to make. And, and when you're dealing with something that's really large and you get a tremendous uh, sample size, you know, you're getting these uh, really nice p values, but um, sometimes not very high effect sizes. Yeah. Good. We've got another question um, from Albandri Alatabi. Uh, this person asks stimulus. Or there's this comment actually, and uh, we want your thoughts on this. Stimulus availability over time may lead to familiarity, which could potentially influence the responses to them. Yeah. That's true. And so, um, you know, you may need to exclude people that have participated in a similar study before. Um, that cuts down on your potential to uh, collect data. So maybe that's not optimal all the time. Um, but that would be something to look at. And and also with the other part, though, is, is that, um, you know, these ideally, these would be like dynamic stimulus sets that you're developing. And so, um, you know, you may have a, a group of images, for instance, that you're starting with, but then people add to them over time. And then you have a pool that you can pull from uh, instead of just looking at a set. But but yeah, you probably you may want to consider asking a question up front about whether or not they've seen any of those items before or something, and then they'd, they'd be excluded. Yeah. Yeah, so there's there's a good part and a bad part, right? If, if it influences the research in a negative way, that's obviously not good. But it, if it also increases our ability to um, use better stimuli and generalize findings better, then that's a that's the good part. So there might be a little bit of a trade off and and a point at which you know we have to control for that. Good. So just in our last couple of minutes here, wrapping up, yeah. um, and anyone else can jump in. Um, uh, the meta research community has been looking at um, AIT pretty intensely. And I think one thing that people seem to be talking about is whether it's possible to, to separate implicit bias from explicit bias. You know, how do we know we're, that these implicit association tests actually measure implicit as opposed to explicit bias? Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that more general question? Uh, yeah, that does. Uh, that is one of the things that people talk about. Like, what exactly is it measuring? Um, I think I mentioned kind of in the beginning. Ideally, um, you know, people are making associations that uh, they're just making these quickly. I mean, you're encouraged to go as fast as you can, right? But you also don't want to make. Um, you also don't want to make mistakes, and the mistakes are based on how they. How the pairings are expected to be. Right? So if you don't respond with uh, whatever with a good trait with um, if I, with a race IAT, I mean it's kind of set up. It's bias so that you you have a, a positive bias toward the white faces. And so if you are, say the other thing, then it's considered wrong. Um, so yeah, it, the. It is harder. I, I really do think it's harder to um, consciously control what's going on with an IET just because of the speed at which you're responding. 
So is it is it really tapping more implicit associations? It probably is. Um, you could, in theory, I think probably slow slow down just enough that you are now consciously um, you know, you're consciously controlling your responses. And that's possible, um, and but not slowing down so much that your response times look really off. Um, so. And, and then if you go back to what I was talking about with memory, I think, um, you know, it kind of goes along the same path as what I'm, what I'm saying really is that you have, you have your memory and you're tapping into that memory. And one, you're doing it, you're doing it without a lot of awareness and one you're doing it with more awareness. And so it, it's the same, if we're dealing, dealing with the same source of memory and it's just a matter of awareness, we may be able to move on that on that continuum of awareness, but we're still accessing the same thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what what exactly is it measuring? Can you consciously control it? I mean, it's it's possible. Um, so we're over time, but I want to squeeze in one more for the people that oh, want yeah, to yeah. stick in there. Uh, Emma Mills asks, there, there is great capacity for planned missing data design here so that stimuli are not overexposed. What do you think about that? Missing data design. Yeah, so ex like exactly what, what are you referring to for the missing data design part? I can allow you to talk, Emma. I'm just going to click on allow to talk so we can hear your voice if you want to jump in. You have to unmute if you want to be heard. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can, yeah. Um, thank you, Chris, for a fantastic talk. Um, so I, I'm having the same kind of thoughts with uh, psycholinguistic uh, research across mm. like 29 variables um, and differing effects in the literature. And a standardized stimulus set like uh, the previous question would possibly become overexposed over time. So a way to mitigate that might be to um, have them in um, different kinds of bins, if you like. And when people take them, they take them in random selections. And mm -hmm. over time, we piece together the data so that not everybody sees every stimulus, but we're collecting enough where we can do missing data imputation. Um, and so it also works with if you're using very expensive um, stimuli, you give that to a core set of your participants and then you give the cheaper stuff. So it, it's something that I'm thinking about so that when you get your experts together and they do that huge standardized, yeah, what do we really need? Mm -hmm. um, you can use it. Um, and because everybody, I'm, I'm guessing everybody would want to use it to begin with, but you could kind of ration it. Uh, and there, there is a kind of theory around it or a method around it that I've heard about. What do you think? No, I think that sounds like a good idea. Uh, and, um, you know, like I said, if it's dynamic, the, the more it grows, the easier it is to, to do, I think, what you're talking about um, and, and prevent the overexposure that, that's kind of come up. But, yeah, I think that that'd be, that'd, be, that'd be a good way to do it. And you could, you know, you could probably... You know, you can manage this as well. I mean, it's possible to manage. So instead of having, I mean, you want it to be freely accessible, but you also may want to say, like, well, how many of these are you going to use and which, you know, um, so you may have um, some level of, of awareness of how many times a particular, well, you actually can do it by downloads, right? So even if you do it randomly, you can know uh, how many of the individual uh, stimuli have been downloaded. And then you can make sure that those are not, if they're frequently coming up, that you spread them out. I mean, I don't know if I'm saying yeah. that particularly well, but but yeah, I mean, I think I think the more you have, the, the easier it is to do stuff like that, and that'd be that'd be great. I mean, that'd be really good for um, different areas of science. So I'm glad you mentioned something totally different than what I mentioned. I think I think the curation of it becomes that scholarship idea that you were talking yeah. about as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Great. Really interesting talk. Thank you. Oh, yeah, man. thanks. All right. So thank you, everyone, for attending. We hope to see you at other webinars. Check the um, MetaScience 2023 website for additional webinars coming up. Thank you so much, Chris. All right, really man. interesting.
Take care, everyone.